one of my favorite sayings is pain is mandatory but suffering is optional life has its bumps and bruises and people get banged up and it's just about what we do with that getting through that pain is a process and unfortunately i'm not wired for process i'm not wired for going through things i've always been wired to go around things my first reaction is what can i do what can i take to get through this quicker and that that's not the way that life works there's no like 26.5 miles whatever a marathon is like if you run it you're going to be done in every experience in my life that I've had a hard time there's been no timetable but eventually I get through it my story of of using alcohol and drugs luckily wasn't that long because I got involved um with heroin in my late teens and, and that brought me to my knees very quickly. I entered my first rehab uh when I was 21 years old. Didn't stay sober, but eventually at 22 ended up uh staying sober and, and I'm sober today 25 years later. So my dad moved out of the house a couple of weeks before my bar mitzvah and and at 13 I was a little confused on what exactly that meant or what was going on in their marriage. I I do remember at my bar mitzvah it was the first time since he had moved out that my parents were together and uh, it was a really awkward feeling uh, for myself. Um, but I think everybody involved, cause when they were together taking pictures, you know, there was a palpable um, a feeling in the air that everybody felt. And, and unfortunately that feeling or, or that tension lasted for 30 years uh, and all the way through growing up. And I think at the end of the day, they handed us uh, me and my brothers and sister a huge emotional bill to pay in something that we had no choice in. I don't think they did it intentionally. You know, this wasn't a premeditated, how are we going to screw up our kids? Let's plan this out. But, you know, resentment, anger, fear, blind people to their actions. And, and I think that's what happened to my parents. I have always been a person who's able to stuff their feelings. And I think that that happened from an early age and being dyslexic and, and not getting the, the stuff as quickly as the other kids. And so my parents divorce, you know, it's a very, very uncomfortable position to be in when your moms or dad are talking so badly about the other one that you just sort of have to sit there and take it. Because you know if you say anything, it's going to make things worse. It's going to throw gasoline on the fire. And so you just sit there and take it where if anybody else were talking like that about your parents, you know, you'd probably get a punch in the face. I, I stuffed that just like I'd stuffed every other sort of negative thing in my life and thinking that it went away or it, pack it down deeper. I was like a trash compactor, you know, just pack all those feelings down and and – but what happened with drugs and alcohol um, is they didn't make me feel those feelings anymore, um, whether it be my parents' divorce, whether it be uh, you know, my low self-esteem, the dyslexia, not feeling smart enough, every single fruit salad of emotions, I didn't feel them anymore. The end of my drinking and using it wasn't because of an overdose, which I had had. It wasn't because of arrest, which I have had. It wasn't because of a car crash, which I had. I just woke up one day, and I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was done. Uh, one thing I, I've learned as a parent is one of the most important things we can teach our kids are consequences. Every action has a consequence. And, and growing up, my mom was always there. My dad was always there to bail me out of trouble. It wasn't premeditated. They weren't doing this because they were trying to screw up my life or, you know, stick a needle in my arm or, <laughs> or whatever, but they were doing it because they loved me and they didn't want to see me get in trouble. So when I got arrested or I got in trouble uh, in high school and almost didn't graduate, somehow all this stuff just went away. So I didn't really ever face consequences growing up. And, uh, I'm actually grateful for all that because it's taught me so much about life 
And it's also taught me so much about parenting. And it's also taught me so much about, you know, my divorce, eventual divorce to my ex-wife, because everything happens in life for a reason, you know, and if we just can, are able to take a step back and be open and aware enough to what those experiences mean, we can learn from them and not repeat them. I think, uh, you know, my story of marriage and then unfortunately divorce is a tale of two sides. One side of that story is a Ben who doesn't take care of himself and do what he's supposed to do in order to be spiritually grounded. And by that, I mean uh, helping out other people, going to meetings, being honest. I was abstinent from drugs and alcohol, but I would say I wasn't sober. And I actually caused more wreckage with people around me than I did when I was using drugs and alcohol. I had become a miserable person. So I got sober uh, November 3rd, 1994. Um, I met Nikki, I think around 97, 98. You know, looking back on it, it was always trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. We wanted to make it work. We had been dating for a couple of years, and society sort of tells us, okay, we're in our mid-20s. We've been dating a couple of years. Let's get married. I, I kind of knew that it wasn't the right thing. Um, and, and, and if you had asked Nikki, she probably would have said the same thing. But, you know, again, this was at a point where I had slowly started doing less and less sort of auditing recovery. That's when decision-making gets skewed for me. We get married. We move to Tampa, Florida. You know, a couple of years go by. We have a beautiful son. But it's always this square peg round hole. I think what happened was we kept on trying. But at the same time, we're getting madder and madder that the square peg won't fit in this round hole. I was not going to meetings at all. I was not connected at all. Behaviors... Uh, the truth telling it was non-existent. It was not a great way to end a marriage. The other side of that is the story of the band who at some point during our separation reached a point of honesty. And I could see for the first time in a long time, the person that I actually was, and that was not a very good person. I wasn't drinking, using drugs. But it still was somebody, somebody who needed to get back to basics and have the humility enough to realize that I was broken and could potentially do the same thing as my parents did and, and stick my son with this huge emotional bill. You know, luckily, I just had enough program in me or enough foundation or whatever it was to get back to basics. And I simply did that, started going to meetings and started working with another man and, and we got to the root of, of some of my issues. And, and at the end of that process, it was very clear I wouldn't want to be married to me either. Our marriage was over. Um, we finally were honest enough to both realize that we were not put on this earth to be husband and wife, um, but we were put on this earth to have a beautiful child and uh, to be best friends. The other part of this process is getting right with the person that you've harmed. And so I asked Nikki to coffee. First thing out of my mouth was I told her I loved her. And I also then went into my amends, my part, period, hard stop. You know, I'm sorry for what I did and I went through you know, all the stuff and became accountable for my actions. And there wasn't, but you did this, or <laughs> if you hadn't done this, I would, but it was just my side of the street. I needed to clean up my side of the street. And, uh, she then in turn apologized to me 22 years. We've known each other. It's the first and only time that either of us have said we're sorry to each other. It was a turning point in our, our, our relationship. And we then turned from, you know, two people who were bitter hatred uh, resentment, just sort of like my parents, to a road of trying to do something different. Uh, I'd asked her, I said, do you have any problem with joint custody? She said, of course not. 
I said, Nikki, all the other stuff can be worked out then. Our relationship going forward was built on a foundation of accountability, love, and forgiveness. I am now 46. Uh, I've been sober for 25 years. And today I am remarried uh, with two other kids. My son, Asher, is now 15 years old. And I co-parent him with my ex-wife, who just happens to live five doors down. Pain is in life, whether you're sober or whether you're not sober, you're going to go through it in life. We all have the capacity to be happy, and we all have the right to be happy. The common thread of happiness is being present and accepting the moment exactly as it is. Once I start living in the past or in the future, I have lost my ability to be happy. And so, you know, one thing that I really try to work on today is being accountable and the admission that I'm flawed and we all are flawed and we're going to make mistakes along this road of life. But being able to clean up at least your side of the street makes that road of life a little bit easier. My name is Benjamin Helfond, and this is my story. <laughs>